fantastic. So today is really for if you're a speaker, a trainer, a coach, a consultant, um, a subject expert, a specialist, you are someone who gets hired to speak at conferences, to go into organizations, um, this is for you today. Why is this good? Oh, we've still got people joining us, goodness me. Um, what I talk about, I'm going to talk about scorecards today, and I want to put that just into context as to why this is important. Um, the last webinar that I gave was to uh, 125 financial advisors, and 12 minutes after the end of that webinar, I had 97 leads for consultancy business sitting in my inbox. Um, and I have a thing called a LinkedIn health check. Literally everybody I meet on LinkedIn, I invite them to go through my LinkedIn health check and it gives them a personalized score and some observations on how well they use LinkedIn. So in essence, it is a quiz, it's a survey, it's a gap analysis tool. Um, and this thing has literally transformed my business and the way I do things. It doesn't just work for me. Here's Hannah. Uh, Hannah is a branding expert here in the UK. Um, and when she first started using scorecards in her business, she said she got 800 leads in the first two weeks. And that was purely through organic posting. No paid ads, no Facebook or anything like that. Purely organic. She says, I knew this was going to be good, but I had no idea how valuable it would be to turn out to be for both myself and my clients. And she says, I also get people to take my scorecard while I'm speaking. Um, and you'll see why that works as well in a minute. And she also said, I'd be devastated if I didn't have this in my business. Um, Mike here is a financial planner in the UK. In fact, he's a behavioral investment coach uh, and he's been using a digital scorecard on his website. And he says he's been blown away at the client data, which it creates. It's now an absolute must in my onboarding process. So what is a scorecard? Well, let me ask the question in a slightly different way. If I was to say to you, how useful would it be to know the name and 40 points of data from anyone and everyone who visits your website or everyone you speak to at conferences and events? Now, as a speaker, uh, those of you that, that speak at conferences, events, uh, everybody's got different ways of collecting names and email addresses. Maybe you offer some sort of download. Maybe you do a business card draw or something like that. We've all got different ways of doing it. A, tr a scorecard literally transforms the way you will do this and you can potentially get the names and details of literally everyone in the audience whether you're talking to 10 people or 10,000 people uh, this extraordinary new approach works um, so what I'm going to do today is because subject experts like yourselves you are experts in different areas I'm going to use for the most part for this example this afternoon I'm going to talk about financial planners and why financial planners well I know them like the back of my hand they are subject experts like you they are also consultants they're coaches speakers seminar hosts many of them are doing podcasts now and many of them on YouTube as well so they're as good as an example as any so what I'd like you to try and do is what you hear today, if I'm talking about financial planners, apply that to your own business and to your own area of expertise and you'll see how it works. So the last time I did a survey amongst uh, financial planners, I said to them, just out of interest, however you get your new leads, to what extent do you have to find out more about the person before you can actually decide whether or not they're a good fit for your business? And to cut long story short, this graph is saying that almost all of them said, yeah, whether I'm using Facebook ads, uh, whether I'm getting referrals from professionals, whether I'm being rebooked, I almost always have to get more information before I can decide. Um, and a scorecard is an amazing tool that just cuts all of that out. It's like filling in a fact find or a get to know you survey before you even speak to someone. It is a question, answer, an analysis tool which sits on the path that people follow when they are searching for subject experts so I would imagine you've all got a website there are people out there right now on Google maybe on LinkedIn as well searching for people like you and your expertise and we are hoping that they'll want to look at our websites and they will decide right I want to talk to you as well it gives people massive value before you ever meet them it creates deep curiosity in your services 
and it gives you all that data to help you choose which people you want to work with because out of those 97 leads that were sitting in my inbox after my last webinar there's no way that i can work with 97 people and some of those 97 people if i can look at their data i will decide for myself actually i don't really want this person as a client but maybe i could put them on my newsletter list what i can do based on the answers they give to the questions on my scorecard i can literally pick and choose the people I want to follow up, the ones I think that I can add the most value to. Gives you the ability to follow up with personalized messaging. So depending on how people answer the questions in your quiz, your scorecard, your assessment, whatever you want to call it, you can pick things out and follow up with highly personalized messaging. And I promise you, when you start using scorecards, this will give you the most highly qualified leads you'll ever have. And that sounds like a, a big claim to make, but uh, please bear with me. So what are we going to talk about today? First of all, how subject expert marketing and lead generation is changing, the problem with our websites, my own including, and how scorecards are literally transforming the effectiveness of our online presence. So first of all, uh, what is a scorecard? When we get into the depths of that, uh, we're going to talk about the theme that your scorecard has, how you choose the questions and the categories that you ask people about, what your results page looks like, how you follow it up, and a bit more as well. And uh, when you stay to the end, um, and we're, we're looking about 90 minutes, um, I will give you a link where you can actually try out a scorecard for yourself. Um, so this is one that I use, could you be speaking more often and for higher fees? It's an online quiz that I offer. There's a bunch of questions in there. It looks at your marketing, it looks at your strategy, uh, it looks at a whole variety of different aspects of speaking, marketing, coaching and consulting. And at the end, it will give you a score and it will give you personalised bespoke commentary and suggestions for improvement. So you can actually see a scorecard from your point of view. And as you go through it, well, what would be a really good idea is to think, well, how could I use something like that in my business? Maybe I'm a customer services expert. Maybe I could create a customer services scorecard. Maybe I'm a futurist. Um, maybe I could create a, a scorecard based on my expertise, my skill. There's a whole variety of different ways that you can do this. So stick around to the end and I'll give you the link for that. So let's go back in time um, to when I first started work. Um, I left school in 1978. I didn't go on to go to university. Um, what I wanted to do was to be a rock concert photographer. Uh, photography was was in my family uh, in fact um, my brother is uh, the UK's top family portrait photographer but I wanted to get into rock concert stuff and my dad said to me so uh, what are you going to do you're certainly not going to be a rock concert photographer um, but this is what I love doing and um, these are some of my pictures from the uh, early 70s Judas Priest Ted Nugent those of you in the states will probably know and maybe love Ted Nugent a band called Slade over here uh, Kiss really um, built their whole show based around uh, what Slade were doing in the UK. So this is what I wanted to do. But at the back of my mind, I guess my dad might have been right. Um, and maybe I should get a proper job at some point. And then a day came when, again, those of you in the United States, you may know of a band called Blackfoot. Great southern rock band. Uh, they were my favourite band at the time. And I still, still think they're great. They were touring the UK. Um, and I'd got a press pass to go and take uh, photos of them at the Hammersmith Odeon uh, in London. And that particular day, they were recording that show for a live album. Uh, and that album, Highway Song, is still out there. You can still get it. Um, and when the album cover came out, um, I was amazed to see that I, that arrow there, is pointing at me. And I thought, well, this is it. This is, this is the pinnacle of my rock concert uh, photography career. I'm on the front cover of my favourite band's album. I'll now go and get a proper job. So um, I left it there and I went down to um, our local job centre and I had an interview. And the lady at the job centre said, uh, Phil, um, we think that after your 10 minute assessment, you are cut out for pension scheme administration for an insurance company. And I had no idea what that meant at all. Uh, retirement benefits planning. And they said, you're, you're just cut out for this, Phil. I said, OK, I'll go with that. As long as it pays, um, I'll go with that. And um, this was the head office of the company I joined, National Employers Life in Dorking, uh, again, uh, just uh, south of London. 
Um, and I mean, what a lovely building to work out of. It was a Tudor mansion, Henry VIII, King Henry VIII. That was one of his weekend places. Uh, I thought, what a lovely place to, uh, to work. And I got a free lunch and they've got a nice sports and social club. But after about three months of, of doing uh, admin work, my boss came out to me and said, Phil, we don't think this is your cutout for this, but we do think that sales might be more your thing. Um, and they packed me off to um, just south of London, um, where I became basically a sales representative for this insurance company. And I, my job was to meet um, 20 financial planners in and around London every single week and to try and convince the financial planners that they should be promoting our particular products. Now I took to this like a duck to water. I, I got to do loads of presentations. It actually underpinned my future speaking career after that because uh, I went to all the trade shows, all the conferences and so on and so forth. And for the next 20 years, I met up with 20 financial advisors every single week. Um, and I saw the good, the bad, and the ugly of financial advisor marketing. And at that time, many financial advisors were starting to get into the coaching world. They were starting to get into the consulting world because they realized that there was more to financial planning than just face-to-face -face stuff. They could do speeches. They could go to conferences. And my um, first book, which came out about a year and a half ago, was really um, everything that I saw that was good about financial advisor marketing. And that the contents of that book are relevant to anyone in professional services. So it doesn't really matter whether you're a financial advisor or an accountant or a lawyer, or whatever it is, that book contained everything that I saw. So it was a book going down memory lane, but my latest book is a look to the future. It's about getting sharp. It's about using data and getting much, much more bang for our buck when it comes to our marketing activities. Now, when I look back to the um, late 1970s and the 1980s, and I compare what marketing was going on back then, compare it with today, one thing I noticed was that back in the day, marketing was very, very proactive. Today, thanks to the internet, our marketing is actually quite reactive. We're quite lazy. We stick up a website, we tick that job done, I'm now in the world of e-commerce, I'll sit back and wait for the leads to come in. It doesn't really work like that, and we all know that, yeah? If we go back to 1978, what were we, what were we all doing? All this stuff, good old-fashioned, old-school marketing. Some of it we're still doing today, but this was all pretty proactive. Whether you were sending out leaflet drops, whether you're doing fax shots, whether you were going on the radio, this was all pretty proactive stuff. Today, if we look at, say, 2020, we're using Google, we've got directory listings, we've got a website, maybe we'll get some referrals. Some of this other stuff, the more proactive things, um, we're doing a little bit of that, but I think the internet has made us lazy, and we've got to really sharpen up with that. Uh, with that. Um, most speakers, most coaches, most consultants have got very professional-looking websites these days. Uh, we've got uh, videos of us in action. They look good, but there is still a problem, and I'll come on to that problem as we move forward. So let's just go back to um, financial advisors and consultants in general, um, and let's take a look at what actually does work um, in, this, in this particular space. So I've done some research myself, and a guy called Michael Kitzes in the United States has done some work as well, um, and it seems that in order the top marketing strategies for top performing advisors, coaches, and consultants are everything on the left. We obviously, if we do a great job, we're going to get referrals. Fantastic. Writing books. Most speakers have written books or are writing books, or they create content in a variety of different ways. Seminars, workshops, coaching, live coaching, and all this stuff you can see on the left. And those of you with, um, with good budgets can also opt for hiring agencies and consultants. So that gets a bit expensive, but... Uh, quite often it really works well. Now, maybe you are um, a newbie as a consultant or a newbie as a speaker or a newbie as a, a, a coach or consultant. What are some low risk strategies for you or for those that might be struggling? And I do know that, you know, as a result of the pandemic, not everyone has come out of the pandemic unscathed. A lot of people are almost having to rebuild their coaching and consulting businesses from scratch. Um, many speakers have had to learn online presenting skills as well from scratch.
just switching on Zoom or Teams is not necessarily, you know, the answer. We've had to learn new skills. So what strategies seem to work? Well, some of them are quite similar. Referrals, working with joint venture partners, doing a bit of local advertising. And local advertising can be at city level. It can be at state level. It could even be, uh, you know, wherever you want to choose. So the list on the right is fairly low risk if you're a newbie or if you're struggling. But what I absolutely love uh, is this idea of old school stuff, the stuff that still works back from back in the day. One financial coach that I know in the UK who does a bit of speaking as well, um, his number one marketing strategy for about 10 years was sponsoring a roundabout. Do you call them roundabouts in the United States on a road, you know, where you go around, you know, is that, do you call that a roundabout or do you call it something else? Can't remember. Um, and we've all seen it. When we've gone round one, we see this sponsor, this, this, this board here. And he, he put one of these, he sponsored a roundabout outside the city where he works. And he realized that 20,000 people saw it on the way into work. 20,000 people saw it on the way out of work. And about 20,000 people saw it over the weekend as well. He said it cost him next to nothing as well. And when he combined that with some of his digital marketing, he got a really, really powerful um, marketing activity as well. Now, I just want to highlight one or two things that um, jump off me, jump out at me from this. And that is that some of these things I would class as educational assets. That's why writing books is so important. That's why putting on seminars and workshops. That's why speaking, you know, speakers who are paid to speak at a conference or event, not only are you being paid, but you're also marketing yourself simultaneously. And educational assets are becoming extremely powerful these days. Um, and I want to explore a bit more about that and why scorecards also fit into that marketing bracket as well. There are a lot of people who would have us believe that we should be doing all of this all of the time everywhere. And I just don't think that is sustainable in this day and age. If you happen to, maybe you're a speaker or a coach or a consultant and you specialize in, I don't know, dentists for sake of argument you will know what magazines dentists read. You will know what podcasts they like to listen to. You will know where they hang out online. So that's where you should put most of your effort. No question at all about that. But this idea that we should be using this scattergun approach where we're putting everything everywhere all the time, I think is just nonsense. And it's unsustainable. And I believe it cheapens our value as experts. And that's why writing books is so powerful. Uh, yet, I still see a lot of speakers doing this. I still see a lot of coaches and consultants doing this. But I think it's time to get a lot more focused about moving forward and how we get our message out there. So, um, yes, some of that's appropriate, but by not all of it, by a long shot. So, what do we think the single most effective marketing tactic is for subject experts? Well, from the research that I've done, and certainly in my 40 plus year career, there is one thing that stands out head and shoulders about everything else. And it is essentially live marketing, seminars, workshops, client events, and webinars. And I said, as speakers, my goodness, aren't we lucky? We're paid to speak. And as we speak, we're marketing ourselves simultaneously. But of course, we're not all on the stage every day of the week by any stretch of the imagination, so that we can put on our own events as well. And time and time again, I have seen that putting on live events is the single most powerful activity. Why? I think it's because people get to see the whites of our eyes. They get a sense of who we are. They see our credibility, our expertise, our professionalism. They can make decisions. They can make human decisions as well. Simple things like, do I like the person on the stage or do I like the person on the Zoom call? And when you combine that with educational assets like books that people can buy, or maybe you're putting on a seminar or workshop based on the book that you've written or the white paper or the special report that you've written, then that's where why the magic happens. Now, when you combine this with scorecards as well, then you have something very, very special indeed. I mentioned Hannah at the beginning there. Um, when she's speaking, she will get her audience to go through her scorecard as part of her presentation. You can do it on the mobile phone and thereby they get instant, bespoke, personalized value. 
and she gets the names, contact detail, and data of everybody in that room that day. And then she can literally pick and choose who she wants to follow up. So how do I market me, the speaker? Well, it's like many of you, I would imagine, there are multiple ways for us as subject experts to get our message out there. Multiple, multiple ways. As I said, I think we need to get a bit more focus, but nevertheless, there's a lot, we've got a lot of choice. But what is missing is that there are hardly any ways at all for people to tell us about them. We put all this effort telling the world about us, but wouldn't it be great if we could find a way for that to find a way to get them to tell us about them so that we can then personalize our approach personalize our follow-ups as well and scorecards are a great way of doing that now i believe that there are eight fundamental problems with speaker marketing let's go through them i think the referral process is changing let's use the financial planner example once again let's go back in time before the internet um, or we could we could be an accountant, or we could be a lawyer, anybody who offers professional services. If we were at a dinner party before the internet, and so, and you know the topic of personal finance came up, somebody in the room might, somebody around the table might say, you know, can anybody recommend me a wealth manager who can help me get my investments um, sorted out? Somebody would say, well, we'll check out my financial planner. They're great. And what you do is you write their name down on the napkin. And the phone number and the next day without any question at all you'd phone them up that introduction from somebody another human being was all we needed that was it was good enough today if we're at that dinner party and that same conversation takes place we get the recommendation check out jones and co financial planning they're great we write their name down on the napkin but the next day we don't phone them up what do we do we go to google don't we we want to check them out we want to see have they got a nice looking website have they got a book um where's the proof of their expertise have they got any freebies we could download so we can get a sense of who they are and what we're about but while we're on google and we're looking at their website of course google's going to show us other financial advisors or coaches or consultants in that area so as human beings we're going to go have a look at their websites as well and we might think well actually they look better than the one i was recommended maybe i'll get in touch with them and of course we might also find a podcast and we might think, well, actually, I can figure this stuff out for myself. Maybe I don't need to hire an expert after all. So we've got to find ways to strengthen the referral process so that when someone does come and look at their website, come look at our website, we, we find a way to engage with them so that we can take them by the hand, literally through the screen, and bring them into our world so that they feel that we are the only choice for their problems, their needs, their concerns, and their particular issues. People need proof of value these days. That's why speakers write books, yeah? Most coaches don't have a formal marketing plan. Whenever I speak at a conference in front of consultants, and I say, everybody put their hands up if you've got a written down marketing plan. Most people haven't. Most people got something kind of at the back of their head. Uh, we have shiny object syndrome, which which tends to kick in. We thought, well, we'll give that a go this week and we'll give podcasting a go next week and we'll give LinkedIn company pages a go next week and we wonder why it doesn't all work. I think also subject experts are not collaborating as well as they possibly could. Most subject experts around the world are not in competition with each other. So because of that, they're missing a trick by not working together. Maybe, you know, if you're in a particular state or in a particular city, you could collaborate with other experts like you, build a one-page website, and each of you commit to adding a blog to it once a month, something like that. Build your, pro build your profile in conjunction with other experts locally. And if you build a collaborative website with um, blogs and good quality content on it, well, guess who's going to find it? Google, of course. So by collaborating, you can also pick up business uh, yourself. As I mentioned, our marketing is very often highly reactive. Our websites look great, but they're not converting as well as they could be. And I'll go into that in a bit more detail. And most subject experts do not know their website numbers. When I do um, my own coaching courses and I put on my own events, I say to people, how many people in this room know how many people visited your website last week or last month? How many pages of your website did they visit? Which page did they bail out on? And most people don't know these numbers. And yet to me, 
This is key management information in your business. And when you do the analysis on your web presence, you'll be quite surprised to discover that you are getting plenty of visitors, but most of them are not going on to make inquiries. And I know that's a sweeping statement because you do get inquiries through your website, but not as many as you could be. And finally, a lot of traditional marketing methods are running out of steam, and I'll, I'll come on to that as we go. Now, we know, and particularly in high-value consultancy, high-value speaking area, hiring you happens over a number of steps. It's not an automatic thing. It used to be you get a referral, that's a piece of business that you could do. Today, it's a bit more complex. Uh, people who are booking us, people who are hiring us need proof. They need more than just a website to look at. Yeah, maybe they want referrals. Maybe they want advocates. Maybe they want to read your book. There's a whole bunch of different. Maybe your speaker bureau or your agent needs to work on them quite hard as well. And I think we need to stop relying on one step websites yeah. and start thinking much more about the concept that one or two of you may, uh, may know Russell Brunson of uh, ClickFunnels fame. He talks about this concept of the value ladder. I mean, it's not unique to Russell. Uh, it's, it's a very old fashioned marketing concept, but my goodness, is it important in today's world. When I talk about traditional marketing running out of steam, you know, throughout the, the pandemic, we couldn't go to networking events. We couldn't put on seminars. We couldn't do any of this stuff. Um, so we had, to re we had to pivot, think of other ways to doing it. Um, and because many people have got used to doing stuff online, some people will never go to a trade show again. Um, some people won't ever put on seminars again. I did a survey amongst some financial planners the other day, and I said, now that we're coming out of, of, of lockdown, how many of you are planning seminars um, for the, uh, the remainder of the year or even next year? And most of them said, I don't think we'll do seminars ever again. So, you know, so one or two problems are beginning to emerge. So let's go back in time again and just have a look at how we got caught up in this whole world of digital marketing and how it was that we got lazy and why it is that we need to have a new look at digital marketing with new light oh. on it um, and how we move forward uh, in a slightly new way. So back in 1998, when digital really first started getting going, we were all learning about it. Um, social media as a concept. Uh, I think. Could somebody uh, mute themselves? Um, apologies, we're hearing your phone call or something. It wasn't, it wasn't called uh, social media back then, it was called social networking. LinkedIn is a social networking site. It was always designed to complement real world networking. If you and I had met at, a, at an event, Bob, um, and we had a bit of a chat, maybe we exchanged business cards, what we'd then go and, go and check each other out online and we could connect online and vice versa. Maybe we'd met on LinkedIn and then when we actually met in the flesh, oh, I know you, Bob, and you feel like you're an old mate, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Um, we saw digital marketing as a really exciting new opportunity and fundamentally we looked at it as free marketing. In many ways it is free marketing, but you know as well as I do, that it's not free, not anymore it isn't. So we then go into the golden era, 2010 to 2017. It was super easy to, to get followers, uh, to get attention, free engagement, everyone would see our content. You know, business that we get did get through digital marketing and social media was free. You could put anything out there, someone would notice it, someone would wanna have a chat with us. If you were even half consistent in the regularity of your posts on social media, whatever platforms you were using, you know, that you were classed as an influencer. And to be quite honest, this all ended up as a great return on wasting a lot of time. And we all know how much time we can waste on social media as well. So those were the good old days, yeah? 2020, it starts to get a bit messy. Everyone's on social media. It's just a mass of noise. It's quite difficult to get attention unless you focus your content on specific markets and in specific areas. None of, none of, this, none of this scattergun approach, but get real, real focus. Audiences these days are getting better at filtering out uh, stuff they don't want to see. Platforms are now monetizing. So, you know, take Facebook. Uh, Facebook five years ago, free money for all of us but now they're monetizing. They want you to pay to play. 
Now, I haven't got a problem with paying for Facebook ads. I really don't mind doing that. As long as for every dollar I spend uh, or pound I spend on Facebook advertising, as long as I get five dollars or pounds come back, happy days, yeah? But most speakers, coaches, and consultants, they spend a dollar on advertising and they get 50 cents back. And that's not sustainable over the long term. So the platforms want you to pay. Again, haven't got a problem with that. You just got to know how to do it. So today, for many, many people, social media is a poor return on wasting time, where it was once a good return on wasting time. So what we need now is focus, discipline, and strategy. So let's bring it up to 2021. It's time to get real. We need to get focused. We need to have a strategy. We need to have a real plan. That focus, that strategy, that plan needs to focus on attracting not just good clients, but actually our dream clients. Who are the people we really want to work with? Um, and when you start creating a marketing plan or marketing strategy that aims high, magic starts to happen. And when you aim at your dream clients and you put all your marketing effort into your dream clients, guess what happens? The people who are not quite your dream clients, they actually start paying attention as well because they aspire to want to work with you. And one of the biggest mistakes that most people make on LinkedIn is that, uh, particularly speakers, particularly coaches, is they put this sort of generic CV um, like profile up there with not much focus. The more focused you can make your profile on your dream clients, your ideal clients, the more of those people will actually start to find you. And I would imagine all of you who are on LinkedIn, you've probably had consultants approaching you saying, uh, give me $1,000 a month or $2,000 a month and I can reach out to your clients and I'll deliver 200 leads a week to you. Yeah. What a waste of money that is. Okay. Wouldn't it be better if you spent nothing on consultants on LinkedIn, but actually positioned yourself on LinkedIn so that your dream clients came to you? Wouldn't that be a better way of doing it? Well, that's what actually happens when you get real focused on LinkedIn. We also have to focus much, much more on converting those people who are paying attention, converting the people who are visiting our website, converting the people who download our freebies from our website. The way we do that is to use much more personalized marketing based on data that they give you. We ought to start thinking about working with influencers and people who really just love you. The people who are already your dream clients who love you, they are your dream advocates. You want to work more with them, yeah? We want to use more education. We want to use more value. And we need to create more curiosity. This is the direction of travel that I'm going in with this. So what's happened to lead gen? Lead gen one was about collecting name, number, and email. Let's call it collecting business cards. Lead gen 2.0 is about collecting data and using that data intelligently for your prospects benefit and for your benefit and thus build better relationships faster. So this is the marketing strategy that I use now to attract speaking business, coaching business and consultancy business. It has four legs to it, using educational assets, using a highly interactive website, in other words, to get people to do something when they come to visit my website, to use personalization and the value ladder concept. We all know what I mean by, and I just want to look at each of these um, in a little bit of um, more depth. Educational assets, I think we all know what they are. Yeah, books, videos, podcasts, webinars, scorecards, personalized assessments, gap analysis tools. When someone goes through your scorecard, could you be a great leader? Answer these uh, 20 questions and find out in the next 10 minutes if you've got what it takes to be a great leader in your organization. Yeah, that's a gap analysis tool. People will go through it because they want to benchmark themselves against the uh, uh, some sort of level of expertise that you have got. So scorecards and gap analysis tools and assessments and surveys are also educational assets as well. Now, most consultants websites look great but they're not converting anything like as much as they could there's no strategy behind them they are over complicated they are essentially a brochure they don't collect data other than an email address in exchange for a tip sheet and they're not converting 
And one of the problems is we all look the same. And I, and, and I no annoy an awful lot of financial advisors and accountants and lawyers when I say to them, when I go down into the local, down the local uh, high street, local city centre, one firm of accountants looks exactly the same as another. One firm of lawyers looks exactly the same as another. One firm of management consultants looks exactly the same as another. One firm of financial planners looks the same as another. And they all say to me, well, hold on, Phil, that's a bit unfair. We are different from our competitors over the road. And I go, yeah, I know you are. I know you are. My 42-year career, I know you are different. The thing is, your website looks the same as everybody else's. And that's how most people are going to find you in the first place. You are a lookalike. And I know for a fact that none of you on this call today are paid to look and behave like yeah. another consultant, coach, or speaker. One of these two ladies here is the real Audrey Hepburn. One of them is a professional lookalike. So the professional lookalike is indeed paid to look and behave like Audrey Hepburn. She gets hired to stand at a booth at a conference so that people can come up and have a, a selfie and, and, and so on. But none of you on this call today are paid to look like someone else who does the same work as you. We've got to start differentiating ourselves much, much better. But the way we do that is through value. And then we get this sort of nonsense, particularly on financial planners' websites. This sounds like it's great, but to be quite honest, commitment to excellence in customer service is not a differentiator, is it? It's the ticket to the game. If you are rubbish at customer service, then you deserve to go out of business, yeah? If, you've got, if you don't have a client-focused approach, you'll be out of business. So this stuff is not a differentiator. It's just fluff, and we don't want fluff. And again, advisor website themes particularly financial planners particularly accountants what is it about lighthouses um, what is it about violins and cruises and elderly folks with their grandkids flying kites on beaches why do we do that it, I, I guess it looks nice but it is not converting your dream clients into quality conversations that you can have and here's something else that uh, that i noticed as well our websites really don't give us anything more, you know, than we can figure out for ourselves. Um, oh, many, many consultants' websites are a bit like this. They, they tell us the obvious, stuff we can figure out for ourselves. If people are going to hire you or me, they have to see that I'm different and I've got something beyond what I can figure out for myself. We have to offer real value. And we this sort of vague stuff, that says we're qualified, we've got a passion for our clients. It's utter nonsense as well. And I found this lovely um, cartoon. I just want to show you this while I just grab some water. Have a quick look at that. So, you know, you get it. Yep, you get the point I'm trying to make here. So what does your website have to do what do your website visitors need whether you're a speaker a coach a consultant any of those particular roles what do your visitors need well they need your website to speak to their specific issue let's use the financial planner example again let's imagine that i am i don't know a heart surgeon and i'm concerned about my uh, level of income that's that i'm going to get in retirement and i'm searching google for a financial planner or an accountant or a lawyer who can help me. But I found the financial planner's website. And if it's a generic financial planner's website, it doesn't speak to me. What I would expect it to say is something like, are you a, um, a heart surgeon worried about the next phase of your life and you've got enough income in retirement? If you are, enter your email address here and download our guide for uh, heart surgeons nearing retirement. There is no way, if I'm a heart surgeon and I arrive on that website, there's no way that I'm not going to give them my email address because that website speaks to me. It speaks to my specific issues and my specific needs. And that's one of the reasons why I say LinkedIn profiles really need to speak to your dream clients. And if you know what a dream client is to you, then you know what their issues are. You know what their problems are. You know what their concerns are. You know what they worry about. Speak to that. And when they visit your website, they need to feel that you're, you're the only game in town. 
Your website has got to welcome them, take them by the hand and bring them into your world. One of the ways you will do that is by giving them proof of your expertise and they need a reason to engage with you. So we all seem to focus on getting website traffic, but what we're not focusing enough on is converting that traffic into conversations that, that lead to serious business being written. Uh, someone's just asked a question here. Let's bear with me. Have a quick look at that. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, oh, that's great. Thank you very much. Ashish. That's super. Appreciate that. So um, I've done some research and, um, and I've looked at financial advisor websites and particularly financial advisors that are stepping out into the coaching world, the speaking world, the consulting world. And I looked at 100 financial advisor websites uh, about a year and a half ago. And I looked specifically at the design and I looked at the data. And what was really nice to see was that most of the financial advisor websites looked really good. Lots of older folks flying kites with their grandchildren, lots of lighthouses, lots of compasses, lots of yachts. Uh, they looked great, okay? And then I started digging a little bit deeper and started looking at the numbers. And the thing I discovered was that out of 100 financial advisor websites, the average number of visitors to the websites over a month was 197. Um, yet they had no idea because they didn't know their numbers. Some of them were getting far fewer than 197, some of them were getting many, many more, but that was the average. So that tells me that even if a half of that 197 were recruiters or people who were never going to hire you anyway, you're still left with 100 people who didn't make contact. And there's a whole bunch of different reasons. So they didn't know how many people were visiting their website. They also didn't know how many pages of your website they were looking at or which pages or how long they spent or what they typed into Google to reach you, where they were or what page they finally gave up. This is critical management information that you need to be really on top of. And when I went back to the financial advisors and I said, let me show you your numbers, their jaws just dropped because they suddenly realized, my goodness, I've not been paying attention. And because I've not been paying attention, I've been missing out on potential leads. I've been putting all this effort on um, driving traffic and I put no effort into converting that traffic. And the one number they really didn't know, none of them, none of them even heard of it, was what's called the bounce rate. And that is the percentage of people who arrive on your website and leave almost immediately without looking at anything else. Now, the, a good bounce rate for a financial planner, speaker, coach, consultant, a good bounce rate is anything under 25%. So let's, we can write off 25% of our website visitors. The average bounce rate for financial planners, 54%. Some were a bit lower, some were in the 80s percent. Um, and then and that, that's when the penny, when the dollar, the cent, whatever is dropped and they suddenly realize, right, I need to make some changes. And the number one reason why that bounce rate is so high and this applies to any website in any industry is the amount of content on the home page on average i counted on the home pages of all these websites an average of 34 clickable links on the home page alone and we all do it if you've got a website as well count up the number of clickable links that you've got yeah and and be horrified and it's human nature to put a lot of stuff on your website. But that is very, very old school. When websites first started, the idea what web website designers used to call it was we need to make your website sticky. We need to keep people on the page. And the way we'll do that is we'll just chuck a load of stuff on the homepage in the hope that they'll get caught up in it or they'll find it valuable. And yet website designers today are still doing that. It just looks better. Um, but when you start stripping away unnecessary links and make your website so much more focused, then the magic starts to happen. And the simple fact of the matter is, if somebody arrives on your website and there's 34 clickable links on it, it just creates confusion. And a confused mind will always say no. So this is what speaker marketing is a bit like. You know, we're doing all this good stuff. People are visiting our website, but it's like hitting a brick wall. Literally, it's like hitting a brick wall. Click here, click here, do this, do that, do the other. And this is the fundamental main reason why the people who are already visiting your website 
aren't going on to have conversations with you because at some point they go, nope, I'll leave. And there's even science behind this as well. It's called Hicks Law. The more choices someone's given, the, it just slows them down. And the older you, you are as well, the even less likely it is that, um, that people are going to respond to, to your website. So what we've ended up with is websites that look great and are basically online brochures. And what you've got is a situation where it is no better than going down to the local shopping mall and handing out leaflets and real brochures in the hope that someone say, oh, you're just the person I've been looking for. It just won't happen. OK, so we've got to make some changes. So to sum that bit up, our websites are getting visitors. They could always get more, but they are getting visitors. They're pretty high quality looking websites, but they're brochures. But those websites are not engaging with people and they are not converting the people who visit them. And it is always the case that the view from inside your business is always a lot better than the view from outside. So your website looks great on the outside, but we want to, when people visit your website, we need to take them in and say, come on, it's even better inside. Come on in, come and meet me, come and experience some of what I do. I tend to believe that a website should do one of two things, okay? And it depends what you do and what your area of expertise is. It should either add value to existing clients or it should convert new visitors, not both. Do a separate website for those two different aspects, but that's for another day. So how do we convert new visitors? Well, first of all, we need to convert the right visitors, yeah? And one of the ways we do that is give them real value and create curiosity. When they arrive on your website, we want them to go, oh, I've got to learn more. I really want to find out more. We need to give them something to do. Now, this is, this is a little bit of a psychology trick as well. It has been proven that if you can get people to do something on your website, it dramatically increases the likelihood that they'll hang around for longer and possibly go on to talk to you. So one little thing you could do, and for those of you in the United States, which is a lot bigger than the UK, you could have a little thing that says, where did you hear about us? With a little drop down box that says, I don't know, Facebook, LinkedIn, webinar, whatever. Just, and you know, you may be interested in where they heard about you, but the reason for having that is actually to encourage them to take that micro commitment of engaging with your website. It's a very low risk commitment, just clicking on, I heard about you on LinkedIn. But the fact that they do it just puts their mindset in a better place and they'll stick around for longer. <laughs> your website needs to address their actual concerns and challenges, to give them a personalized experience, and I wanna talk about this next, and to give you opportunities to start conversations. Now, what do I mean by a personalized experience? You've only got one website. How do we personalize that visit to each and every visitor? Why is personalization important? Well, when I was working for the insurance company and I'd gone up the, gone up the ranks and I became head of sales, um, all of a sudden I've got a hand on our marketing budget as an insurance company. And as a result, all the advertising agencies were approaching me and say, Phil, uh, we'd love to work with you. And this is a marketing piece that I got sent one particular year. Um, and an advertising agency, as you can see, I mean, you can see for yourself what it is. Um, this is personalized with my name. Phil, you change your toothbrush when it's worn out, so why not change your agency? Now, this was done before um, digital marketing. This was done by hand. So this took a bit of effort. Um, do you think it got my attention? Of course it got my attention. They then sent me another one a month later. Do you think that got my attention? Uh, yes, it's actually framed and on my office wall. But that's, per <laughs> that's personalized marketing, you know, um, and it's very, very powerful. Let me give you another example. Um, a few years ago, I was selling my house um, and I went around, I, I took a day off to go around all the local agents um <laughs> surprise surprise they all said the same thing their offices all looked the same they all promised me a great service they all promised me an early sale they all said literally the same thing their fees were all much the same as well and i went back at the end went over the end day thinking well i'm now more confused than i ever was how do i choose which one to go for i thought i'll sleep on it overnight the next day my mail arrives and I opened up one, one, one envelope and inside the envelope was a piece of red carpet, eight inches by six inches. 
I thought, okay, maybe when I eventually move house, there'll be a little square on the ground. I could maybe use that one day. But then I turned it over. And on the other side, they'd handwritten my name and said, all our clients get the same red carpet treatment. <laughs> now, that's proper old school. It's beautifully personalized. It's super easy. And I give that one to you as a gift today. Get down to your local carpet center, buy up a few yards of red carpet, cut it up into squares. Every prospect, send them one of those. They won't ever forget you. You will get noticed, no question at all. So that's why personalization is important. So how can we do that with our websites? Well, whatever kind of marketing we do do, we end up sending people to our value ladder. And it's the series of get to know you steps where the trust starts to build. Yeah. And the purpose of a value letter is fundamentally to make it easier to start conversations with people. Yeah. Build relationships and so on and so forth. Now in, in marketing, you all know this, there are two types of purchases. There's the impulse purchase. I want a cup of coffee. It doesn't need much thinking about. I go buy a cup of coffee. Yeah. Pretty easy, simple decision. Whereas working with a speaker, or a coach or a consultant or a financial planner for that matter takes a bit more thought yeah and there's a, there are perhaps a few steps along the way before we think okay this isn't like buying a, a cup of coffee this is a high value purchase which is going to take some con commitment so i consider it in quite a lot more detail than i had before fundamentally those steps are about building trust and what we quite often see these days is all sorts of businesses using this value ladder approach. My dad was a dental surgeon and he always knew that the real high value money for him was in the cosmetic dentistry stuff. Drilling holes in people's teeth, taking people's teeth out, there was no money in that whatsoever. Um, so what you see these days is a lot of dental practices offering free teeth cleaning, free teeth whitening. I mean, once upon a time, teeth whitening was actually at the top of the value ladder, but now anybody can do it, yeah? So a lot of dental practices, they'll offer this free just to get you in the building, just to treat you nice, look after you, get a video testimonial. And if you, you enjoy the experience and there's not much pain involved with teeth cleaning and teeth whitening, it is much, much more likely that you're gonna stick with that dental practice and eventually pay for the high value stuff, yeah? Chiropractors do exactly the same thing. What they really want you to do is to get out your credit card and go on the long weekend wellness retreat with some expert speakers, um, some yoga, nice chefs and so on and so forth. But it all starts down the bottom, yeah? Free consultation, free massage, get you in, look after you. And then over a series of communications, we get to the top. Gyms do exactly the same thing as well. They just get you in, treat you well, what they really want you to do is is to hire a personal trainer over a long period of time now this is my value ladder what i really want you all to buy and i won't be doing a pitch at the end today uh, what i really want you all to buy is my long weekend deep dive marketing retreat where we go off to a really nice hotel we have some really nice food um, and we really get down and dirty when it comes to marketing. But if my website only promoted my weekend marketing retreat at X thousand dollars, there's no way you're going to buy it because you don't know me. You don't know anything about me. You've not experienced anything I've ever done. So to get you to there, I've got to offer a few other things. So I've got a couple of Facebook groups. I use a scorecard. I've got an ebook and so on and so forth. We gradually go up the ladder. So the things in green are free. The things in blue are sometimes free, sometimes I make a small charge. The things in black, I always charge for. The things in red are reassuringly expensive. But you've got to go through that process before people buy the expensive stuff, yeah? So what could a, a, um, a value ladder look like for you guys and girls? Any of these things, to be quite honest. You know, some of you may already be doing weekend retreats. Some of you may have your own inner circle that costs people a sizable investment of their, of their time and their money. But to get people there, the easy way to get people there is through a series of other steps. And I'm sure as speakers and consultants, you've probably got one or two of those things on there as well. But, you know, you don't need to have all of those things. You could have just those things. Start with a scorecard. 
at the end of the scorecard say thanks for taking my scorecard here's a freebie here's a free copy of my book free copy of my ebook whatever point them to your facebook group or whatever else you do in fact you don't even need to have that many things you can even cut out the podcast cut out the consultancy it's entirely up to you but the scorecard is an astonishingly high value um first step on people's value ladder. i mean it's amazingly high value and I'll, I'll show you as we go martin here he's a financial planner and a coach and a speaker here in the uk he's written three books on investing and you know there's nothing in those three books that any other financial planner could have written but most financial planners in the uk have not written books so martin's several steps ahead of most of them catherine here she's a um a personal finance coach and speaker. She's a rising star in the financial planning world and the coaching world in the UK, but she uses Facebook. She does online challenges. What she put here, uh, join my five day free challenge to help you identify what kind of relationship you have with money, get rid of self-limiting leads, all that stuff that, that, that we know. So that's how she gets people. Um, this gentleman here, his name is Pete, Pete Matthew. He's like the godfather of content marketing in, in the UK in the financial planning space. He has got an astonishing YouTube channel. Uh, he's got an amazing podcast on personal finance um, that people absolutely adore. Uh, he's the people that everybody look up to. And I'm sure all of you today here watching this, you've got some elements of these things that you do as well. But what I'm going to encourage you to do is stick a scorecard right at the front of it. So again, let's travel back in time. Let's go back to 1988. Um, Kylie was uh, rocking the charts. Bruce, I mean, Die Hard. Remember Die Hard when it came out? What a big movie that was uh, uh, at the time, okay? Now, I was a sales rep at the time for that insurance company. And one of the financial advisors that I used to meet on my patch, on my panel, was a guy called Mick. He was a financial advisor and he worked with his wife. He was the most successful financial advisor I have ever met anywhere in the world. And he lived in a place called St. George's Hill in Weybridge in the UK. Uh, Jez is nodding his head. <laughs> Jez knows exactly where St. George's Hill is. St. George's Hill, and I'm sure Beverly, it's, it's the equivalent of Beverly Hills uh, in, the United, in the United Kingdom. And all the rock stars the film stars in the uk most of them live in st george's hill cliff richard big big pop star some of you may know he was mick's next door neighbor tom jones so tom jones lived two or three doors up the road as well now mick as a financial advisor he used to do the personal finance for uh, all sorts of people in south london but he also used to do um little seminars and workshops work site marketing um, he also used to do a lot of work with printing companies, uh, owners of printing companies. There were quite a lot in his part of the world. And he would do the personal finances for the owners of the printing companies. And then he would always say to them, would it be okay, could I do a presentation to your, your staff, your colleagues? Um, perhaps in their tea break or the lunch break or something like that. And they would always say, yeah, absolutely. And he would do a 20 minute, half an hour presentation. And he would do a thing called Mix One Minute Money Quiz. And here it was, a postcard. I mean, talk about high tech, yeah? And bear in mind, this was pre-internet. He would give out a postcard with five questions on it. Um, and he would say to them, look, uh, before I go today, if you could just fill out the answers to those questions, put your name and address on it. And before I go, I will pick one at random and I will give out a book token, a record token, uh, a bottle of wine, just to say thank you for your time today. He would do his presentation, he would collect in the questions with all the answers, um, and as a financial advisor, you know, just looking at the answers there, he would straight away know whether or not this was somebody he might want to follow up. But he would, he would follow up every single one of them. Some days he would take home five postcards, some days he would take home 500 postcards, and he would send each and every one of them a personalised letter based on the answers to the questions. Now, um, a bit of cut and paste, because if somebody answered the question one way, he got a ready-made paragraph. But nevertheless, the letter was personalised. And so he could go back and he could say, Mr. Smith, thanks very much. I hope you enjoyed the presentation I gave. Thank you for completing the scorecard, the postcard. Um, I can see that you are on top of your savings. 
and that's going to stand you in good stead for the future. But I also noticed from the question about what if your your family you died today, you've got a problem if you get hit by a bus tonight. So you're on top of your savings, good, but you've got a real problem potentially. Is that something that you would like to address? Now here's the amazing thing: when he sent the personalised letter, ninety nine times out of a hundred, he got a positive answer. Yes. How can we deal with this, please? And why did that work? Because they'd experienced his expertise. They'd seen the live presentation. They'd engaged with him by answering a few questions. He got a, they got a personalized response with their actual name on it. Then they got a follow-up from him on the phone or by letter saying, um, would you like some help with this? And they almost always said yes. That, guys and girls, by any other definition, is a scorecard done before the internet um, so how could we use that in an internet age what is scorecard marketing it is just perfect for any business that needs to get data to know and understand each prospect and an individual who should be using scorecards businesses that help clients to achieve a goal fulfill a desire or solve complex problems need to get data to know whether or not someone is actually worth following up as a client because, I mean, let's take mixed scorecards. You know, out of 100 postcards that people filled in, he will know that 20 of them he won't want to work with for whatever reason. But he could still add their names to his newsletter list. And those 20 people who he doesn't want to work with, they might yet refer their friends to him in the future. So they are still of value. Businesses that make recommendations to clients based on data. This is who scorecards really work for. Scorecards do not work if you sell a product, like an actual tangible thing, uh, like a mouse, uh, like golf clubs, something like that. Okay, it's only for if you sell expertise, basically. You probably know this, data-driven marketing is just a method of, uh, of marketing that gathers data uh, from customer interactions and so that you can better understand the way they're thinking and what's going on in their head. But it is proven time and time again that when businesses use data there are far better outcomes for everyone greater revenue for you greater value for the clients simple as that but what scorecards also do is they create curiosity because at the end of the day a scorecard is a quiz it's a survey it's an assessment and every single person on the planet loves a quiz and every single person on the planet has taken some sort of online quiz at some point in their lives. Yeah, because it's quick, it's easy, you get a personalized instant report, and maybe you get a freebie. So the rest of the world has been using this for years. But the cons cons consultancy market, the speaker market, the financial planner market is only just starting to, to realize just how powerful this is. So people actually find it difficult to resist taking a quiz. So if, if I go back to that example of a heart surgeon and I arrive on a financial planner's website and it says, are you a heart surgeon concerned about your level of income in retirement? Find out if you're ready for retirement in the next five minutes by taking our online assessment for heart surgeons. Again, if I'm a heart surgeon, there's no way that I'm not going to take that quiz. What have I got to lose other than my email address? There's no way I'm not going to do it. And it works on this psychological thing that human beings love to benchmark themselves against some sort of standard that some expert has set, because we can get an instant assessment of our personal situation. We can compare ourselves against other people who are like us. We can acknowledge and spot areas of weakness and areas for improvement. And we can get access to an expert with personalized help and get a personalized plan. And then the next clever bit is that most people aspire to want to do better. So when I do my LinkedIn health check for people and their LinkedIn health check says to them, okay, you've done okay. But from the answers to the questions you've given to me in my scorecard, I can see that you're missing a big trick here. You're missing a big trick here. Is that something you'd like to work on? And nine out of 10 of them go, I guess it is something I'd like to work on, Phil. How much do you charge? Or words to that effect. So people go through the test, they get their score. And if it's a test or an assessment that is actually based around something that's of interest to them, they will want to get a better score. 
how can they get a better score with my help or with your help depending on your area of expertise and as i said we've all done these things haven't we how fit am i could i lose 10 pounds in the next 10 weeks am i a natural leader is my business ready to pitch am i a natural salesperson am i ready for retirement find out in the next five minutes so as I mentioned right at the beginning, I just wonder if any of you are beginning to think, okay, that's interesting. How could I apply that to my expertise, my knowledge, what I do in my particular business as well? So what the scorecards end up being, it is a simple, attractive website survey page. You get a home page, you get questions, and you get a results page. And then they get an email at the end to follow it up. The scorecard, um, it looks really nice. I'll show you some examples in a minute. The questions that you ask are simple, yes, no, or multiple choice questions. They get their score and a personalized response. And this is dynamically created as well. The comments they get are based on their score. And it, so it gives the, you, them an opportunity for them to talk to you or for you to talk to them. And I don't know what uh, data um, regulation you have in the United States, but we have this European thing called GDPR. Uh, I can see your heads nodding. Um, so it's all going to be done properly and it's all going to be done professionally and we've got to follow laws. But this tool is compliant. Just a bit more depth on this. So it's a custom branded online assessment. You build the thing. It has your logo. It has your imagery. You try and make it look like your website. So even though I've just said we don't want too many people flying kites with children, if that's your thing, then you could put that on your scorecard but this one will actually get people to take action because they've got something to do. They get a traffic light score, they get a dynamic report, it gives them instant value, and so naturally they're they are interested in what else you have to offer. It gives you all the answers to all of their questions. It enables you to follow up based on data, based on the answers they gave you, and you can also pick and choose who you actually follow up. Now, I know for a fact that all of you attract your new inquiries, your new prospects from a variety of different sources. A scorecard is a great way to create one landing page for all of them. So maybe you work with a bureau, maybe you work with an agent, maybe you work with existing clients, maybe you use Facebook ads. You want to send everyone to your scorecard so you get some continuity. Uh, so it's one central destination uh, for them all. What does it do? It improves the effectiveness of your marketing by putting value at its heart. It actually makes your website start working. It creates this curiosity thing that I keep talking about. It encourages your site visitors to genuinely engage with your website. They actually do something. They don't just leave. It gives you data and then that enables you to personalize your follow up. Now, this to me is an absolute game changer for speakers, coaches and consultants because it is it's part of your value ladder. It is a really high value first step on your value ladder. It makes your website start working. The quality of the leads are suddenly become highly qualified and high value. You can identify the good bads, the ugly leads and the leads you, you really do want. You can personalize your approach and just having the thing at all positions you an expert as an expert. If you've got a book that you've written, that positions you as an expert, if not the expert. Having a scorecard will position you as an expert, yeah? And it's also a tool that you can use to work with your agents and your bureaus. So for example, people go through your scorecard, you might want to share that information with your agent or uh, with a particular bureau as well, particularly if you've got a really good relationship. And a really good thing about this as well, we are not um, sharing data that we shouldn't be sharing because every lead that goes through, there's a button in the software that you can anonymize the lead um, until you've got permission to share data as well. So all of this is leading to a point with the quality of the conversations that you can have with prospects is just far, far ahead of anything you've ever experienced before. So essentially what the scorecard has is these elements. You choose a theme. Uh, let's say leadership. Am I a natural leader? Um, you then think about, okay, so what sort of questions could I ask people who are interested in taking my scorecard? Um, you, there's a, some, a scoring mechanism that's built into the software that you use to do this as well, uh, that comes up with the score. 
you get an overall score and you get category scores as well. And I'll give you some examples in a moment. They get their report. There's a call to action and then you can follow it up as well. What you really want to do, so although a scorecard is a standalone website in its own right, you could actually put a banner right across your current website and say, uh, we are specialised in leadership. Find out if you could be a great leader in the next five minutes by clicking here and taking our scorecard. And you say, are you ready to become a leader? Are you ready to become a great salesperson? Are you ready to transform your customers' lives? That sort of thing. So I've got my LinkedIn health check. And I ask people on LinkedIn, how effectively are you leveraging LinkedIn to attract your dream clients? Click here, find out in the next five minutes. And here's just some examples of some other scorecards uh, that are out there uh, being used as well. Uh, the, take the bottom one there as well, the brand assessment. Does your target market like and trust your business? Find out in the next two minutes. And it leads them through to the questions, they get their score, they get their answers. If you were a financial planner, these are the sort of themes that you might want to be using for your scorecard. Financial fitness scorecard, and you've noticed you don't have to call it a scorecard. You can call it an analysis tool, a diagnostic, a quiz, a health check, any of these, any of these uh, names you could use. So again, how could I use this in my business? Maybe I'm a futurist. What would be the overall theme for this? Maybe I'm a customer service expert. What could the, what sort of questions, what sort of theme, what sort of category questions could I be using? So let me show you some. So um, I've got a LinkedIn health check for anybody and anybody I meet on LinkedIn, but I've also got one for one of my target markets, financial advisors. Every financial advisor is on LinkedIn. Most of them are not using it very well at all to attract leads. So I say to them, financial advisors, discover your LinkedIn strengths and weaknesses with our free health check. Take our free test, learn how to attract more of your ideal clients, click here, take the test now. And it asks them a bunch of questions. They get their score, I get the lead, I choose which ones I want to follow up. I incentivize them to take my scorecard by saying, look, when you go through my scorecard, I'll give you a copy of my book for free. Or this, or I'll give you that, or I'll give you a consultation, I'll give you something just for going through it. And all of you guys as speakers, coaches and consultants, you've probably got something that you could uh, give away as an incentive or as, a, or as a thank you. So the questions I ask in my LinkedIn health check are these sort of things. Do you have a LinkedIn strategy? Yes or no. Have you personalized your URL? Um, do you thank people for looking at your profile? Um, all the sort of stuff that I know most people don't do on LinkedIn. But what I am doing in the scoring mechanism is I, I'm going to reward them for the right answer. So if they say, yes, I've got a LinkedIn strategy, the software will give them a, a, a point. If they say no, they won't get a point. And at the end of the day, when they've been through the whole thing, um, they get their score. And the categories of questions that I ask are uh, questions about their LinkedIn strategy, their LinkedIn profile, like, have you got a photo? It's amazing how many speakers don't have photos on the LinkedIn. Anyway. Uh, how do you communicate with other people? How do you engage? What sort of content do you post on LinkedIn? Do you have a company page? And are you using hidden features as well? So those are my categories of questions. They get their questions. And this is what the questions typically look like. So they look really nice. There's a completion bar, a progress bar down the bottom. Um, and, you know, they go through it at the end. There, there are good questions for scorecards and there are bad questions for scorecards. Uh, bad questions are questions that are too long and too detailed. Um, bad questions are questions that people need to stop and think in too much depth. We certainly don't want people to have to go and leave the scorecard and go and look up the answer. And there are some questions that are just too, um, they're just too close to the bone, too intrusive. Do you need a consultant? You know, as soon as they see that question, they go, oh, I know what you're doing. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. So a financial planner doesn't want to ask a question like, how much have you got in your investments? Don't do that because people will just go, oh, I know what this is. Um, so you, you're not trying, you're trying to add value to people. You don't want to ask, do you hire expert speakers? Okay, that's not what this is about at all. Um, so have a think about this. How could you apply this approach to your speaking, coaching, or consultancy 
business. I think there's a variety of different ways. So let's just take speakers for sake of argument. You could use this to create curiosity in who you are. It's a way for people to get value before they even meet you. And I know a lot of speakers have YouTube videos, but that only goes so far. Uh, because YouTube videos and show reels are designed to make you look good, yeah? They don't, they're not designed to really highlight your expertise. Show reels are like adverts. Scorecards and the value they give are go far, far deeper. They're a brilliant way to collect names and contact details at conferences. So you can literally say in the middle of your speech, here, go to this link and you put the link up on the screen. Find out, and you could do a special short scorecard for conferences, or maybe if you're doing a breakout session, or maybe you're doing a whole day workshop, you, then you can incorporate your full length scorecard in that as well. But you get real data, and then you can follow it up in real time. Maybe you're doing a workshop, and people take your scorecard, and you could say to people, look, does anybody here mind if I share one or two of the results that you've just done? Uh, Bob, Mary, thanks for taking the scorecard during the break. Um, now I noticed you answered that question in a particular way. I noticed you answered that question. So you can use it in real time as well. Follow up with people after the conferences. I mean, I'm sure all of you have done this. I've done it. I mean, I've collected tens of thousands of business cards over the year, over the years, tens of thousands of them, hundreds of thousands of them probably. And I've got them all in drawers, in cupboards around the house much to my wife's <laughs> horror. Um, I don't know why I don't throw them away, but here I could just do it through a scorecard. I don't need business cards anymore. Great way to build closer relationships with your agent, but also to upsell other products as well. So on my LinkedIn scorecard, um, they get their results page and on the results page, it says here, thanks for taking it. Click here to download a free copy of my book. So they click a button, and it goes through to my website and it says, oh, before you go, um, just for you today, you can download the book, but would you be interested in a course, uh, the audio version of the book? Um, and today it's only $20. So you can also upsell products as well. If that's what you're into, it's entirely up to you. Uh, if you have a really, really tight niche market, uh, dentists, for example, the scorecards work even better and uh, this is what a results page might look like and you can customize them with different colors and so on and so forth um, and it's it's customized with their name and I don't know if you can see it on your screen it says here um, your report has been emailed to your email address and it's not showing on this one um, but a lot of us and I know you've done it because I've done it when we do these online assessments quite honest quite often we will put in a fake email address won't we uh, because we we feel we're going to get spammed or scammed and so what you can do is give people the opportunity to change that fake email address into an actual email address because once they've gone through this and they realize actually this is legit this is pretty good and I've got real value they actually then want uh, to put in their real email address as well something as well uh, else the software behind this also shows you um, a really interesting thing that a lot of people um, they revisit their results page quite regularly several days afterwards. So even though they've got an email that says, here are your results, click here, go, go have a look at your results. The scorecard um, software is showing that they will look at the results and they'll come back again later. And then they'll come back the next day. Then they'll come back the next day, which proves that they have found this of real value. And then it's up to you as to how you follow it up. So they've got the results page, they've got their overall score, they've got their category scores as well. Um, and you should put testimonials on there, maybe put a few bonuses, a few freebies on there as well. Um, some social proof, maybe some clients that you work with, that sort of thing as well. And yes, put a call to action. Now, in reality, most people will not pick up the phone and want to talk to you straight away. But as I said, they do revisit their results page quite regularly, but you get an instant email the moment someone gets their results page you get an email that says john smith has just finished the scorecard click it and then so you can go and have a look at their results and you can decide what you want to do with it how you want to play it 
you can hook it up with your CRM system so you can have a sequence of emails following this up. Uh, entirely up to you how you would do that. I would imagine you already have your own process for following up leads wherever they come from. So you as the scorecard owner get their name, their email address, their phone number, where they heard about it, answers to all the questions. You can see their category. I mean, you get a phenomenal amount of data before you've ever spoken to them. I mean, that is, this is really game changing. Uh, but also, it's a great filter. You can cut out the stuff you don't want. Still add them to your newsletter list, but really focus on the quality people that you actually want to work with. And you do what I do is you say, thanks for taking the scorecard. I see that you did really well in this particular area of the, of the survey, uh, but I noticed a couple of areas for improvement in this particular area. Is that something you'd like to work on? Yeah, that's, that's how you do it. And one of the things for people who've already got scorecards, they are often amazed by how well you know them. Uh, one financial planner I know who's a speaker in the UK, he said, clients have said to him, are you some sort of mind reader? How do you know this about me? I mean, they don't find it creepy. They find it valuable, um, <laughs> which is really quite, quite important. So what you've got here is your own research engine, your own market research engine. You know, you could put up a scorecard and then you could just chuck Facebook ads at this just as a tool to gather data. If you get some leads out of it, all the better. But you could use a tool like this to research your market as well. The date, the amount of data that comes in, you can then cut it in a variety of different ways. Um, you can download the data on spreadsheets. There's a whole bunch of different things. If you have colleagues, if you have a team, you could use the data that comes through for some aspects of training, maybe even recruitment as well. And the data that comes through, you can use that data to inform your other marketing activities. Maybe you notice that um, on your could I be a great leader scorecard, you're noticing trends coming through. So you could use those trends in your newsletters, your web, whatever else you do. It's all about data today. If you've got people who feed you, can't feed you business as well, use this as part of the relationship that you have with them as well. Encourage people who go through your scorecard to share it with their friends, their colleagues. And something else that we're beginning to notice is that potentially um, if you want to sell your business at some stage in the future, the fact that you've got your own lead generation tool that gets serious data at the front end, that's going to be highly appealing to somebody who wants to buy your business in the future. And there's more. I mean, you can do, you can use this thing in a whole variety of different ways. And I would imagine one or two of you already been to think, oh, actually, I can think of other ways that I could use this in my business. Um, analysis, maybe you're working in-house with a particular company or an organization. You could create a scorecard just for a particular project, cohort analysis, as they call it. There's a whole bunch of different ways that you could use. Measure of success. There are one or two people who are putting every client they have through their scorecard every 12 months. And you can compare their answers to the questions as each year goes by and you can spot trends. And again, it gives you conversation pieces that, that you can use uh, to follow up. So, you know, we're only limited by our own imaginations how to use this thing. And although I pitch this thing as a lead gen tool, I've realized over the last year that actually it's much more than that. It's an asset of your business. And if you've got a powerful asset in your business that is performing all sorts of tasks and functions, then you've really got to show it off. You've got to promote it like crazy. Put it on your website, put it in your email signature, put it on your business cards, put it in your out of office email, put it in your wider social media, put it on your YouTube, put it everywhere blogs and articles, every podcast episode you do, put it there, put it, mention it at the end, every seminar you ever do, you ever do, mention it at the end, every webinar that you ever do, put it in there at the end, every conversation you ever have with anybody, mention it, you get it, yeah, there's all bunch of different tools vouched for as a directory listing tool in the UK, uh, which I'm encouraging people to, to put it there, I mean, and LinkedIn, I mean, this is, <laughs> this is amazing, there are 24 different places that you could promote your scorecard on LinkedIn alone. Uh, and for most speakers, coaches, and consultants, 
their clients and their prospects, they're all on LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is potentially a massively powerful uh, tool for you to use this. Um, if you use Facebook stories or Instagram stories or even LinkedIn stories, stories is a new thing on LinkedIn, in case you've never seen it, you could promote your scorecard in a friendly and a highly attractive kind of way through that particular medium as well with a click to, uh, to action as well. So it's not just a marketing tool, it's an asset of your business. And it's just starting to wrap up now, just to summarize, what's it do? Instant value for your website visitors, personalized report based on their personal situation. The results page is proof of your expertise, enables you to choose who you want to actually follow up. You understand each prospect as an individual and follow it up with personalized messaging and you start to stop having to rely on old school marketing that is beginning to creak and crack and not work as well as it used to. You're giving people exceptional value before you ever speak to them, before you ever send them an email, before you ever email them. And suddenly your online presence starts to work. And that's the key thing about it. Does it work? Well, let me give you an example. I've done multiple, just as I'm sure you have multiple webinars I've been doing over the last year, uh, 18 months. Uh, the most recent one I did was to a firm of 125 financial advisors. I was doing a LinkedIn session, how to use LinkedIn, 125 financial advisors on this webinar. And I said, look, stick around to the end and I'll give you a link to my LinkedIn health check and go through it and you'll get a personalized assessment of how well you are using LinkedIn with some tips on how to start actually using it properly. I gave them the link at the end. I said, bye bye. Uh, went to make a cup of coffee, came back 12 minutes later, and there's 97 leads sitting in my inbox. Now, I don't want 97 new clients in a day, but what I do want is quality new clients. So I, what I was able to do, I went through the data, I looked at the answers to the questions, I said, no, don't want you, don't want you, I like the look of you, I'll follow you up, I'll follow you up. Uh, you, you get what I'm saying. This is how you, how you do it. Really, really powerful thing. If your scorecard isn't working, it usually comes down to one of five things. The, th the theme isn't clear enough, or people are bailing out early. Even if someone stops halfway through, you still get notification that John Smith started a scorecard but didn't finish it. So you could still set, follow them up and say, hi, John, thanks for starting the scorecard. I hope what you did you found useful, but I noticed you didn't finish. Was there a problem? Here, have another go. The look and feel, maybe that's not right. So these are the things that are the things not quite working, yeah? Um, once you build your own scorecard, you start using this approach, you actually want to test it. You want to go through it yourself a few times, make sure the scoring logic is working, make sure the results commentary is appropriate to your target market. So you go through it yourself a few times, get some family members to go through it. They'll give you an honest opinion of uh, whether or not things are any good get some close friends to do it and actually go to some existing clients that you've got as well. People you really know and get on well with and say, look, this is something new that I'm introducing in my business. Could you just test it out for me? Tell me what you think. Is it rubbish? Do you think I'll get some value out of it? Um, what have I missed? Uh, and get honest feedback from your existing clients. They will be extremely useful to you. And again, any people who introduce business to you as well, get them to test it as well. As somebody said to me the other day, how do I get my hands on one of these fast? Um, and here's a couple of screenshots from a couple of financial planners um, of their scorecards. And these ones are branded up to look like their actual website. They've got a button on their actual website that says, take our readiness for retirement scorecard. And they click a button and when they go through to the scorecard, it looks like they're still on their website. It's got the same branding, the same feel. Um, you can do it yourself. I'll happily give you a link to where you can use this. There's a variety of different software tools that are out there. You can do it yourself. It will take you some time. You can do it yourself uh, with training. And obviously I uh, offer training or you can do a fully bespoke one. Um, I work with people now and we literally build your scorecard from scratch. Um, so those are the three ways that you can, that you can do it essentially. And a couple of other examples here. Um, and you can see these have got financial planning, um, themes, 
this guy here, he's, a, he's interested in behavioral economics, um, helps people to understand how their behavior impacts <laughs> their investment returns, yeah? Uh, we've all done it we've all sold our stocks at the wrong time we've all bought stocks at the wrong time we are our, our own worst enemies when it comes to behavioral uh, so he's got a scorecard which tests people's behavior around money um and uh, his name's mike and this is what he said about his as a financial planner i've been using a digital scorecard yeah i've been blown away at the data it creates and it's now an absolute must in my onboarding process now i pitched this to him as a lead gen tool and he is using it as a lead gen tool but he came back to me and said phil to be honest this is better than a lead gen tool this is a tool that helps me to understand potential clients and he says regardless of where my leads are coming from whether it's facebook or seminars or wherever i'm putting every single person through this so that i can get a better understanding than before i actually talk to them um, so that's how he's using it as well so uh, we've got to the end and I would love you to try one for yourself. Um, I have got a scorecard for speakers, coaches and consultants. Could you be speaking more often and for higher fees? Discover if you could develop a stronger, more in speaker brand. Now I'm going to show you this, not to try and sell you my coaching consultancy or anything like that, because I'm sure you're all perfectly good at that yourself, but I'm showing you this so you can see a scorecard in action and actually have a go and experience it as, as a potential prospect. So uh, when we're done, later today, whatever, go to this link and just have a go. Just experience it for yourself. Um, so you can see how the thing is set up. Uh, it'll take you five to 10 minutes um, and you'll get a sense, you'll see the way the theming works. There's more to the homepage. You'll see a bit more on how that works. There's a bit of process that it, it shows people. It'll show you how the questions are asked and you'll see that most of the questions are simple. Yes, no, or maybe questions, maybe one or two multiple choice uh, questions in there. And then you click to get your results and you get your results page and you'll see your, that it's personalized to you with your name all over it, dynamically created text. You'll also get an email from me to say, thanks for taking the scorecard. Um, and it will give you a permanent link to your results page so that you can go back and have a look at it another time. So that's the link to go to speakermarketing.scoreapp.com um, and you'll get a sense uh, of how this thing actually works. Mm. And I now want to go back in time to 1988 and to relook at that. And I had no idea at the time just how clever that was. And I now realize why this particular financial advisor was the most successful financial advisor I've ever met in my life anywhere in the world, simply because he shared some expertise, he gave some value and he followed it up in a, with a personalized message. That's why it works. It's as simple as that. Um, so I don't know if any of you've got any questions right now. Your probably heads are just a spinning a little bit right now. Laura's iPad has just entered just as we're finishing. Uh, so it's got a time zones wrong but never mind um anybody got any questions right now that's fine or if you'd rather um just message me personally or privately find me on linkedin uh, more than happy to answer any questions that you're, you're interested in but just give it a go see what you think um and if you're interested i will send you the links to the software package that i use um but if you're interested in working with me i can help you with that obviously i can do that so uh, we're about done. Thank you so much for um, your time today. Uh, really, really appreciate it. Um, I know giving up an hour and a half of your time is quite a commitment. So I really, really appreciate that. Um, and uh, it'd be great to meet you again sometime. And um, thanks a lot. Nice to see you all. Thanks. Take care.